Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, and welcome to a special City Club of Cleveland Forum at the Global Center for Health Innovation. I'm Dr. Lisa DeMoore, Executive Director of Laurel School's Center for Research on Girls and Senior Advisor to the Schubert Center for Child Studies at Case Western Reserve University. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the founder of the Center for Youth Wellness, author of The Deepest Well, healing the long-term effects of childhood adversity, and the first Surgeon General of California, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. The first time the phrase adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, entered our lexicon was in 1998 after a landmark study by the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. This study of more than 17,000 adult patients found that incidents of childhood trauma, including physical abuse, substance abuse, poverty, and mental illness, among others, presented health risks in later life. Over the last decade, pediatrician Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris has emerged as one of the strongest voices advocating for a public health campaign addressing ACEs and their potential effects on long-term health. She has developed screening methods to treat families and children experiencing toxic stress and founded the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco, which employs a clinical model that recognizes the impact of adverse experiences on health and effectively treats toxic stress in children. Dr. Burke Harris has served as an expert advisor for the Clinton Foundation's Too Small to Fail initiative and for California Governor Jerry Brown's Let's Get Healthy California task force. Her work has been profiled in The New Yorker, in Paul Tuff's book How Children Succeed, and in Jamie Redford's film Resilience which was shown in the 2016 Cleveland International Film Festival. A mother to four children herself, Dr. Burke Harris is the recipient of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism in Medicine Award presented by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the 21st Heinz Award in the Human Condition presented by the Heinz Family Foundation. Earlier this year, California Governor Gavin Newsom named Dr. Burke Harris Dr. Burke Harris, the state's first Surgeon General. Dr. Burke Harris earned a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a medical degree from the University of California, Davis, and a Master of Public Health degree from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction. It's really my pleasure and honor to be here to share um, a bit about a, an issue that has been a tremendous passion of mine for a little over a decade now. Um, and that is this issue of childhood adversity and the effect that it has on our health over the lifetime. Childhood adversity is a story we think we know, right? So if I told this audience that things like abuse, violence, addiction, even divorce experienced during childhood can lead to emotional or psychological issues later in life, 
No one in this room would be surprised. In fact, some might even say, we know this because we've lived it. But what if I told you that adverse childhood experiences like these in high doses can have the same impact on your health as eating 33 strips of bacon a day? What if I told you that this type of trauma left unaddressed can make someone more than twice as likely to develop asthma, autoimmune disease, heart disease, and even cancer, and cut our life expectancy short by decades? For a long time, like everybody else, I had only part of the story. In 2005, when I finished my pediatrics residency at Stanford, I wanted to take my training to a place where I felt like I could make a difference, some place where I felt like I was really needed. And so I came to work uh, for a hospital in San Francisco, and together we opened a clinic in the neighborhood of Bayview Hunters Point, one of San Francisco's poorest and most underserved neighborhoods. And a funny thing happens when you uh, open a clinic in a neighborhood like Bayview Hunters Point. So step one is that you have to establish trust with the relation with the trust and relationships with the community. So when folks saw me in uh, the third church service in a row on a Sunday afternoon. And when they literally saw me go door to door in the public housing projects in uh, Hunters Point, I guess they begun to believe that I was the real deal. And they entrusted me with their greatest treasure. And that was the health of their children. So when we opened our doors, immediately uh, what began to happen was that over and over and over again, patients were being referred to me. And the most common complaint was ADHD, right? Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. But a funny thing happened, right? In, in medical school, what we learn is uh, when you're, when you're uh, training to be a physician, you learn how to do a history and a physical. And as I was listening to my patients in the history part of the exam, what I was hearing over and over again was that my patients were being exposed to severe and significant adversities. And that I noticed an odd pattern that these behavioral problems were occurring in the kids, occurring most often in the kids whose parents had drug addictions or mental illness or who were witnessing domestic violence happening at home. But it wasn't just their behavior. I will never forget 10-year-old Kayla, and that is a pseudonym. <laughs> um, when I asked her mom about her asthma triggers, right, like what could it be that was activating her asthma? I had put her on two rounds of very powerful medications to try to keep her out of the hospital. What this mom said to me was, you know, doctora, I noticed that my daughter's asthma tends to act up every time her dad punches a hole in the wall. And so for me, I threw myself into the research about how early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. Because I was noticing a pattern, but I hadn't yet connected the dots. And I will say, I learned how to connect the dots from my dad. So early on, I realized that my dad was not like other dads. Basil Burke is a Jamaican immigrant He's the father of five, and he also happens to have a PhD in organic chemistry. So when we were kids, when he would walk up on the five of us kids acting crazy, throwing paper airplanes, he would not do what your typical parent would do, right? Stop that now or you're going to put an eye out. No, instead, my dad would come up on us playing 
and he would grab his stopwatch and his tape measure and he would say, okay, now if you time your throw and then measure the distance with gravity at 9.8 meters per second squared, you can calculate the lift under the wings, right? So in hindsight, this was brilliant parenting because my brothers would drop their weapons and get out of there as fast as humanly possible. But not me. I couldn't get enough. My dad brought physics and chemistry and biology to bear on everything that we did. I will never forget, as a Jamaican family, we ate a lot of curry. And uh, there was one, one time I got a, uh, a yellow curry stain on my white blouse. And as I went to wash it out, the stain changed from a bright yellow to a purpley pink. And of course, I was horrified that my blouse was ruined and ran to show my dad. And of course, his reaction was, oh, curry must be an acid-base indicator. <laughs> <laughs> but what I learned from those experiences is that there is a molecular mechanism behind every natural phenomenon. You just have to look for it. So when I dove into the science about why I was seeing this pattern between kids experiencing high doses of adversity and the physical and behavioral outcomes that they were having, I came across a paper that changed everything for me. And this was the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that was done by the CDC and Kaiser and published in 1998. And together, what they did was they asked over 17,000 adults about 10 categories of adversities experienced in childhood. These include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent is mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there's parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you get a point on your ACE score. And then they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. First, ACEs were incredibly common. Two-thirds of their population had at least one adverse childhood experience, and one in eight had four or more adverse childhood experiences. And by the way, this was not Hunter's Point. Their population was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. So for an individual who has four or more adverse childhood experiences, we're talking about double the risk for ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Triple the risk for chronic lung disease, two and a half times the risk of stroke, more than double the risk for cancer. Now, for a lot of folks, right, the, the thought was, OK, this makes a lot of sense. If you have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all the things that are going to ruin your health, right? This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. Fortunately, right, a bunch of really smart scientists decided to challenge that assumption. And what they found was, yes, uh, engaging in high-risk behavior is, does increase the risk, right? So that we do see increased risk of high-risk behavior uh, with high ACEs, and that's a really important thing to know. So for an individual who has high ACEs, if you avoid high-risk behaviors, that's one way of avoiding the health risks. But it turns out that only accounts for about 50% of the risk to health. What the heck? That, that hardly seems fair. You mean you have a rough childhood and you don't drink and smoke and engage in uh, bad behavior and you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer? Well, the reason for that has to do with the way that early adversity affects children's developing brains and bodies. 
So it all starts with what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is the brain and body stress response, and it controls what we call our fight or flight response. And it works a little something like this. Now imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear, right? What happens? What happens in our brains and bodies? Immediately our amygdala, which is our brain's fear center, sounds the alarm and stimulates the activities of all kinds of stress hormones in our bodies, including adrenaline and cortisol. And so our hearts start to pound. Our pupils dilate, our airways open up, right? We shunt blood to all of our big muscles for running and jumping and away from that itty bitty muscle that holds your bladder closed so you may pee your pants, right? <laughs> but that's okay because you're ready, right? You are ready to either fight the bear or run from the bear. But if you were to think about it, Fighting a bear wouldn't seem like a good idea, would it? No, because he's big and he's got teeth and he's got claws. And that is why this fear center, the amygdala, sends projections to the part of our brain that's responsible for judgment and impulse control and executive functioning, the prefrontal cortex, and turns it way, way down. Because you don't want impulse control getting in the way of survival. Right? And instead, was it, what it does is it turns up something called the noradrenergic nucleus of the locus ceruleus, or as I like to call it, the part of the brain responsible for, I don't know karate, but I do know karate, right? <laughs> this is our within the brain stress response, and it gets us amped up. Now, the less obvious thing that happens when we activate our stress response is that it also activates the immune response. Because if that bear gets his claws into you, you want your immune system to be primed, to bring inflammation, to stabilize that wound so that you can either live long enough to beat that bear or get away. It's brilliant. It was evolved over millennia to save our lives from a mortal threat. But the problem is what happens when that bear comes home every night. And this biological process is repeated over and over and over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to repeated activation of the stress response because their brains and bodies are just developing. And exposure to adversity in childhood affects what we call the developmental trajectory. It affects the way that subsequent systems develop, not only children's developing brains, but also their developing immune systems, hormonal systems, and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed. So now that we know this, now that we understand the mechanism by which early adversity leads to these negative health and behavioral outcomes, what can we do about it? Well, that's a place where the science is equally clear. Listen, we have quite a bit of work to do on uh, research and advancing the science, but there are a couple things that we know for sure. Number one is that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are healing for kids. I'm gonna say it again. Safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments are healing for children. And number two, early intervention improves outcomes. So I want to tell you about a patient I saw, Lila. Lila was a three-year-old girl who came to see me for her regular physical. She had no complaints except that she was itty-bitty. Her mom was worried about whether she was growing enough, and she didn't seem like she had a great appetite. Now, 
At the Center for Youth Wellness, the organization uh, that I founded now uh, nine years ago, we implemented a practice of screening all of our patients as part of their you know, routine physical exam for adverse childhood experiences. Because as a physician, as a clinician, there's, I wanna say there's almost nothing more important that I can do in my clinical practice than understand whether or not this child has the supportive and nurturing relationships that they need and whether they have been exposed to adverse childhood experiences. So we began this routine screening. And what I found on this screening for Lila was that her A score was a seven which made me realize that the reason this little girl was having trouble growing was likely because of toxic stress, this overactivation of the stress response that leads to all of these changes in the body. And what we know now is that things like sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, and healthy relationships all help to counteract the effects of toxic stress by reducing stress hormones, reducing inflammation, and enhancing the ability for brain cells to make new connections to each other, right? Neuroplasticity. And when Lila and her mom engaged in a resource called Child Parent Psychotherapy, which cares for both parent and child at the same time, it's a two-generation intervention, within six months, Lila was back on the growth curve. This, I think it's good, it's worth it, right? And the science of how we address toxic stress is advancing in leaps and bounds. In a randomized controlled trial of children in foster care, children who were randomized to high quality nurturant caregiving, right, showed improved development of the white matter structure in their brains as seen on MRI as compared to children who didn't uh, receive nurturant caregiving. So what the science is showing us now, right, is that the stuff that, you know, our grandmothers have been telling us, right, that these nurturing relationships, these connections, these social connections, they make a difference and they are healing down to the molecular and neurobiological level, right? So in our, um, the other thing that we saw in our center was that when we looked at all of our patients, not only was, were their A scores having a significant impact on their health, it was having a profound impact on their learning. When we did a retrospective chart review and looked at all the charts of all of our patients uh, and assigned them an A score based on their history, what we found, number one, was that very similar to the original A study, 12% of our kids had experienced, I'm sorry, two thirds of our kids had experienced at least one A's, 12% had experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. And this was for a population where the mean age was eight years old, right? It had been happening right in front of us, but until we began asking systematically, we weren't receiving this information of the degree to which it was affecting our kids. And when we looked at the health outcomes associated with that, for our kids who had four or more adverse childhood experiences, they were twice as likely to be overweight or obese and 32 times as likely to have learning and behavior problems in school as our patients with zero ACEs. 32 times. The relationship was so apparent that I almost missed the most important part of that lesson, which was for our kids who had zero ACEs, 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. For our kids who had four more ACEs, 51.2%. I was so busy as a scientist looking at the odds ratio and the relative risk and doing the statistical analysis that I almost missed the headline. 
For our kids with zero adverse childhood experiences, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems, right? Our kids are, are not broken. What this data was telling me was that these behavior problems were a direct result of toxic doses of adversity that our children were being exposed to. And the reason that's so critically important is because right now, what's the number one treatment for ADHD in the United States of America? Stimulants, right? Ritalin, Adderall, Stratera. And the challenge with that is that if you, if you have an, an under-functioning prefrontal cortex, if your executive functioning is, is under-attentive, then you give a stimulant and you improve the functioning. But if that child is unable to pay attention because their brain is bathed in stress hormones, then adding a stimulant may not be the right intervention. And in that case, well, the critical intervention is to reduce the dose of adversity and enhance the systems and, and, and capacities of buffering in the caregivers who are in that child's life. And these are the things that the science and the research is showing us make a difference in terms of brain functioning. But the, the problem is, right now, right, there are far too many pediatricians around the country who are scratching their heads and wondering why their patients aren't responding to the ADHD medications. And part of the reason for that is because we need to raise awareness of the issue of adverse childhood experiences and the ways that it can lead to this toxic stress biology which affects children's developing brains and bodies. Currently, according to the, the most recent assessment of the American Academy of Pediatrics, only 4% of, pediat of pediatricians in the U.S. are screening for toxic stress. A lot of doctors still aren't aware and most haven't received any training on how to identify kids who are at risk. This has to change. I believe that right now we are standing on the cusp of a new revolution. And it is every bit as consequential as the one that was sparked by Pasteur's discovery of germs, right? When we learned that actually microbes cause infection, then we were able to implement interventions that actually address the root cause. And we started by doing simple hand washing. And then we learned to sterilize our equipment. And then we started sanitizing our water, right? And then we figured out how to develop fourth generation antibiotics. So right now, we're still in the hand washing stage. But someday, I believe that we will be looking back at ACEs and toxic stress the way we talk about seat belts and secondhand smoke now, right? That, you may, I'm looking around, there are enough folks here. You all remember back in the day where that mom would be driving the car, Four kids in the back seat, no one's wearing seat belts, she's smoking the cigarette, right? All the windows are up, right? And, and, and now, if that were to happen, an auntie or a grandma or an uncle or a spouse or a someone would rap on that window and say, girl, don't you know? Don't you know that smoking the cigarette with, uh, with the windows rolled up, all the kids in the back seat, is gonna give them sec secondhand smoke, it's harmful to their health? Don't you know that you have to, uh, Buckle them in, right? There are still so many parents and families and communities who believe that what happens to children when they're little, they'll forget about it, they won't remember, right? Who don't recognize that early adversity can profoundly affect lifetime health. And not only that, that what happened to us when we were little is affecting how we parent and that we can hand it down to our children. 
and that it is important for us to first and foremost recognize what's gone on in our own histories and practice the self-care to be able to regulate our own stress response so that we are able to be a healthy and effective buffer to the young people who are in our lives. I believe that someday knowing your ACE score won't be stigmatized, but will be as important as knowing whether you have a medication allergy. And here is how we make that happen. Number one, it starts with raising awareness, shouting it from the rooftops. Everyone needs to know about ACEs and toxic stress. Number two, every doctor in America needs to be screening. Screening patients and establishing new protocols for treatment, for treatment are absolutely critical. And number three, parents and caregivers need to be armed with information about how they can protect their kids. Educators and police officers and judges need to understand how they can be part of the system of buffering caregiving. Employers need to understand how they can support their employees in creating communities of healing, right? And I am here today to invite you to be part of that revolution. Toxic stress affects how we learn, how we parent, how we react at home and at work, and what we create in our communities. What starts out in the wiring of one brain cell to the next ultimately affects all of the cells of our society, from our families, to our schools, to our workplaces, to our jails. We must reflect the truth of the human experiences in the stories that we tell. We must bring this work to the masses in every medium that is available to us, and together, we have the opportunity to rewrite the ending for millions of people across this country. Thank you, and I invite you to join me. Thank you. Wow, okay, I'm Stephanie Jansky, Director of Programming at the City Club, and today we're at the Global Center for Health Innovation, listening to a forum with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, the founder of the Center for Youth Wellness, author of The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, and the first Surgeon General of California. We're about to begin, the other round of applause is fine. We are about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone joining us here today or via our live stream. If you have a question, please line up behind one of the microphone stands in front of the room. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club and our staff will try to work it in as time allows. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point and actually questions. Um, may we have the first question, please? Have you done any research with children who have been separated from their parents at the border and how this experience might affect them? Um, uh, that's a great question. I um, have, so I, I haven't uh, done research on the kids who are currently in, uh, at the border. I have cared for many children who have been separated from their parents through the process of deportation or migration. And um, last, last summer, I had the opportunity to testify before Congress on this issue. And what I stated in my congressional testimony is that um, the, the administration's policy on separating children from their caregivers is essentially a recipe for toxic stress. If you take children uh, who have gone through the harrowing experience of migrating to our country, who oftentimes are fleeing very scary or dangerous situations in, in the places that they're leaving, and then uh, we, we bring them into a uh, detention setting and separate them from their caregiver, 
it, going through all of those adversities is sufficiently challenging to a child. But when they go through that experience, and then we take away the thing that we know is the greatest buffer against the development of the toxic stress response, uh, in my uh, scientific and professional opinion, it is absolutely unconscionable. Thank you. Dr. Harris, I was blessed to be here today. Uh, very insightful and informative talk. Back in 2012, on the day of the Chardon school shootings, I started what I call the One Heartbeat Rocks, reaching our children with kindness and sensitivity initiative. Uh, we partnered with Reject, a uh, film that was screened at the Cleveland Film Festival in 2013 uh, to create a society where all children are respected, accepted, and protected. Uh, what, what do you want us to do to help you spread the word about what you're doing? It, it, it sounds like what you're doing already is tremendous. And I will say that many people ask me that question, what should we be doing? And my response to that is, you all are here working in your communities every day. And you recognize this, the, the needs and the challenges of your communities. And the critical piece is understanding the, the foundation of this work. But so much of this work truly is um, incredibly, it, it, it's what we know to be common sense. And I, I, um, I loved what you said about young folks being respected, uh, protected, and wait, I didn't, I don't remember the third one. But in any case, I would say just to continue doing what you're doing, I think it's critical that we also establish connections between the work that we're doing. Because so many folks who are working in the community feel like they have to solve this problem all on their own, that they have to reinvent the wheel or boil the ocean by themselves. And what I say um, to individuals in that s situation is, you know, what, what, as a medical provider, we're going to do a certain piece. We can screen for adverse childhood experiences and recommend certain um, treatment interventions. But what happens in the community is also critically important, and that needs to be connected. Uh, what happens in uh, the educational settings is also absolutely critically important, and those need to be connected as well. And so being part of uh, a coordinated system of care means that we have to kind of get out of our own uh, little spaces and connect and coordinate uh, with others. And that can be challenging at times. Everyone's trying to raise money. Everyone's trying to, you know, and so that can create barriers. But really putting the child at the center and coordinating uh, across systems, I think, is critically important. Thank you very much. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, your being here is a blessing. I just need to say that. Um, Thank you. My name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the State Board of Education. And um, as a member of the State Board, I have been advocating for this kind of research and trauma-informed uh, teaching strategies to be uh, given to, for all educators in Ohio. And I've also been advocating for teacher prep programs in colleges and universities to include this kind of research and trauma-informed strategies for everyone who's going to be teaching children. Um, so I want you to know that that is hopefully one day will happen. But um, my question has to do with these um, programs in which they feel they can teach children how to behave. There's one that's all over Ohio, and I'm not going to call it by name, but the whole goal of it is to teach children to walk down the hall and so forth. Can you explain why if children are in survival brain mode, uh, they are not in their thinking brain, and it's going to be really hard to teach them how to behave if they are experiencing toxic stress? Yeah, so what I would um, say is that I think that some of the things that are critical when we look at trauma-sensitive uh, and trauma responsive school environments is number one, helping every adult in the, in the educational space to be able to recognize when a child is showing symptoms of toxic stress, right? When they are uh, um, dysregulated, number one, how to recognize that, 
Number two, how to be able to uh, create that safe space to allow that child to be able to uh, regulate, self-regulate. And of course, for adults, right, that starts with understanding ourselves and how are we doing. Um, And then in addition, you know, one of the things as I hear a lot from educators, um, because educators, a big part of their role is managing behavior, right? In many ways, educators are um, dealing, are forced to deal with the, the, the symptoms of toxic stress, but without having adequate supports in the educational environments. And I think that's another piece that is absolutely critical as well, to be looking at how do we make it, uh, how do we use a recognition of this issue to help make it easier for educators to do their jobs by having the appropriate supports in the educational systems. But uh, to your point, just asking a child to um, uh, regulate <laughs> or, or, or behave themselves, uh, you know, is a little bit, uh, in my mind, like asking a person with uh, tuberculosis to just stop coughing. If you don't deal with the root cause, suppressing the symptom is not going to be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Ben Milliden with United Way of Greater Cleveland. Um, we've seen a national movement now to address the social determinants of health, particularly using health system resources, and obviously safe environments are, are one of those social determinants of health. It won't surprise me in the future to see health plans and hospitals directly funding certain social determinants of health, like transportation, food, and housing, that can have very quick return on investment financially. Now, we can argue all day, and I would, that maybe that's not the first thing we should be prioritizing, but that's what the health plan want to prioritize. With this kind of early intervention, that's much harder to do because it's a longer term investment um, and you don't see the return on investment for a long time. There will be a lot of churn in health plans to that when that actually comes about. So have you seen any strategies that have successfully been able to bring health system resources to bear on early intervention? Um, that's a, a, a wonderful question. So I, I will say that when it comes to this issue of addressing um, the, uh, the environmental antecedents of, of life course health, right? Um, money is always at issue and there's never enough of it. Uh, at the same time, I, I feel strongly that when we look at, for example, um, the HIV AIDS epidemic, Right? If we attempted to solve that problem with all of the money that was available to, for HIV AIDS in 1980, right, we wouldn't solve it because raising awareness helped to generate resources for the issue. Um, uh, but when, so when we think about how we uh, target resources, I think a big part of it, number one, as I mentioned before, again is aligning resources, uh, figuring out how, how, do we, um, um, h- how do we have that seamless coordination of care, and some of that means in investing in the data systems that allow us to be able to share information across systems so that the folks who are already doing excellent work can do it in a way that's more coordinated so that we can get better outcomes. And there are, I think, some, uh, some models of folks who are doing really thoughtful and innovative work. Um, of course, as I'm standing up here, the idea of pulling one out of my head. Um, uh, but, but there are wonderful models. I can you know, follow up with you afterwards and, and, um, and, and share some. But I think the big part of it is making sure that we are um, not only aligning our resources and coordinating across systems, but also using some shared metrics and also making sure that we're doing that evaluation, I think is critically important. And, and slowly but surely, right, bit by bit, uh, you know, folks always ask me all the time, what is the program that is going to solve toxic stress? Or what is the, you know, the, the intervention? And it's not one intervention, and it's not one program, and it's not one thing. It's going to be all of us working together with a shared goal in mind and advancing towards it in everything that we do.
Hey, what's going on? Uh, my name is Stefan Kennedy, and uh, I kind of feel like I'm like a living, breathing example of an ace. Like, like I grew up in foster care. My mother was incarcerated when I was two. I never met my father, all that. But um, when I turned 18 and graduated high school, et cetera, um, I grew up out of the idea of like, my mom is the reason why my life is like this or whatever the case may be. Like I just brought it upon myself to, um, you know, like my, my life is what I make it from this point. But um, after like watching your TED talks and then like this form, I um, came to draw conclusions like, okay, so maybe certain characteristics that I do carry or like I was diagnosed with ADHD and like all kinds of things like that. It is um, because of my adverse childhood but I'm just saying, like, as a 23-year-old now, how do I address that and um, try to re rewire my brain, like, mm -hmm. moving forward? Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I think that one of the, the first and um, I, I think a critical piece that you've already accomplished is, um, is recognizing that, okay, so because of what I've experienced, so maybe my body might make more stress hormones than the average person would in certain situations. And so there's a couple things that you can, you can uh, uh, do with that. So one of the first things that you can do with that is just recognizing that it's going on. And sometimes when it feels like uh, maybe you feel compelled uh, to react in a certain way, or so you can recognize, oh wait, you know what? Now is the moment where I just need to calm down and take a walk around the block or go shoot some hoops or go do some, you know, catch up with someone who who is a source of care and 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 nurturing for me. Right. And um, I talk in um, as I as I mentioned, the factors of uh, sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health and healthy relationships. You know, I think that um, it, all of those things are really important, and especially the older we are when we start the interventions, the more of them that it's good to do, right? And I know a lot of folks feel, um, you have different feelings about, uh, you know, for example, uh, mental health uh, intervention or mindfulness, but I, what, the data is, what the data tells us is that that makes a difference. The, those relationships and being in um, a, a, a safe and helpful relationship with someone who can help us recognize and identify what we've been through and how that affects how we respond to things that are in our present right now makes a huge difference. And what's fascinating about that is that it, what that can mean is that when we are in our day-to-day -day experiences, instead of continuing to be re-triggered and reactivated by so many of the experiences that we have on the daily, we can recognize how we can respond to that differently, and that can reduce our total uh, dose of stress hormones moving forward, right? But there's one thing I want to say that I think is really critically important, is that when we talk about ACEs, when we talk about, you know, one in eight folks with four or more ACEs, right? Um, we're not talking about those folks over there, right? We're talking about us. And one of the things that I think I mentioned it at the end of my book. It probably is, you know, in the last chapter, I didn't, um, it didn't get as, as much uh, uh, coverage as I would like. But one of the things I want to mention is that um, remember that that stress response was designed to save your life from a bear. And it is also the source of our superpowers. And so I think that for, 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 Many folks, right, it's, it, we can hear the conversation and it can feel really heavy and it can feel really difficult. And um, I, what I talk about at the end of my book is even in my own experience where I talk a little bit about my own ACEs and um, to be able to recognize, wait a minute, if I can understand this well enough to be able to make sure that um, when my stress response gets activated, I can use those powers for good and not for harm, that I don't take it out on myself or the people around me, but instead I can channel that energy into changing the world, 
into protecting other folks, into being a better doctor, into being a better parent, into uh, giving my energy to the community. One of the other things that kind of activates those same pathways in the brain is, uh, believe it or not, altruism, right? Doing, uh, re doing kind things for other people. And so understanding our, our biology that way gives us the opportunity to say, OK, so instead of activating my brain with um, you know, uh, substances, alcohol, or something else, I'm going to activate my brain by making a really amazing connection with someone else and doing something kind for them. Right? So we learn how to substitute the, the harmful coping mechanisms for healthy coping mechanisms that are not only healthy for us, but others in our lives. I hope that's helpful. Dr. Ellen Rome, Cleveland Clinic, thank you so much for not just that articulate and awesome response, but for all of your life's work and giving us all words that we can use to translate ACEs into accessible um, society and, and individual practice and behavior change. We're already in Ohio um, implementing some of the screening. In fact, the Ohio AAP just won the large chapter award for, for doing some of these similar changes. Um, so we're excited about that. We've also been a state where legislative pushes like seatbelt laws and no smoking in public places has had vast behavior change to help the uh, four kids in the station wagon with a mom smoking. <laughs> what would you suggest for the next realm of Ohio-based um, policy and legislative changes? We've got a, we've got a governor who's ch pediatric friendly right now. And uh, we have a window of opportunity with not just this room full of people singing your song, but, but lots of us in the state. What would you say are be, you know, would be best places to put that effort? Yeah, I think that there are a couple of um, pretty straightforward. So in California, we are implementing um, a requirement for uh, routine A screening for everyone on Medicaid. Right, so that's the, that's a we're we're moving to that uh, in 2020. Integrated primary care and behavioral health is absolutely critical, and supporting um, the systems and processes that allow that to to happen. Team-based care, which we also know is really critical to be able to um, uh, do this work successfully. And similarly, in, uh, investing in, as I mentioned before, some of the data systems to be able to, to enable this work to happen across systems. I think those are absolutely critically important. Hi, doctor. Is there any work being done among medical school students to normalize ACE scores? There is work being done among medical students. Uh, it's happening sporadically. So I think that the, the medical schools that are, uh, so s medical schools are kind of, you know, independently uh, deciding whether they want to incorporate this in their curriculum. And, um, you know, what I would like to see is this be a uniform part of medical education for every um, doctor or clinician to be. And not just in, in medical schools, but in other places as well. They're, they're, it's being incorporated into teacher training, into mental health professional training, into social work training. So it's being incorporated in various fields. But what I would like to see is a much more standardized part of the curricula for all of these fields. Hi, I'm Yvette. And um, I'm want to know, is there a relationship between ACEs and infant mortality? That's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, there is. Um, and, I, um, and, and that's one of the reasons why the research on toxic stress, I think, is so important and so critical. Because what we see is that, um, uh, number one, the, um, the greater mom's ACE score is, we see greater risk for um, uh, for uh, pregnancy loss, and we also see an increased risk of uh, for infant mortality. 
And so, I, and, and that's, that, I'll just add to that, that's the reason why this work has to be two-generation work, right? We have to support both the caregiver and, uh, and the child so that we can interrupt this intergenerational progression. And that is something that I believe in the next uh, coming decades that we will be able to absolutely change these dynamics. Can we do one, one, one Wait, two more? You go. No, I think well, she's she's manning the mic. We're good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. oh, one more. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Please. Okay, my name is Beth. I'm a for, I'm an A survivor, like us all in this room. Um, my supervisor Holly Ritzenthaler is right here, and Dr. Erica Staniff. And I just want you to know that we are currently working and breathing your work. And uh, please find them if you have any questions. I don't want to name drop because I'm going to forget something. So <laughs> here is my question. Um, I'm a social worker, and I just got done with the 18-month uh, child parent psychotherapy training. So I'm doing that in the field, and I'm working with NEON to help get these ACEs, uh, these children screened, and then get them into the therapy. Um, do you have any insights on your experience or evidence-based practices on how to best talk about this with parents in the community? Um, so in my uh, previous role at the Center for Youth Wellness, one of the things that we um, did was we created the National Pediatric Practice Community for ACEs. And um, uh, in part of that work, we worked in partnership with Healthy Steps, which is a, uh, a national initiative of the Zero to Three organization, and actually created like a series of uh, patient education materials and handouts that can actually be downloaded from the NPPC uh, website. It, if folks join um, that website, it's nppcaces.org. And, um, and, it, and yeah, there's a whole slew of handouts that can be shared on, you know, talking about parent, parenting with ACEs, talking with your child about um, uh, ACEs, how do you uh, create these safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments, and kind of all the different steps. I think there are 12 or 18 different handouts. So I can, I can, um, connect with you afterwards and give you also the, the name of folks on the team who could send those to you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, today at the City Club, we're at the Global Center for Health Innovation, listening to a forum with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, founder at the Center for Youth Wellness, author of The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, and the first Surgeon General of California. Today's forum is the Stephen A. Minter Endowed Forum, made possible by a generous grant of the five member banks of the Cleveland Foundation. We're delighted to have Mr. Minter with us today. We appreciate your longstanding support of City Club programming. Today's forum is presented by the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation. It's part of the Health Equity Series, sponsored by St. Luke's Foundation and the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland, as well as our Resilient Family Series, sponsored by St. Luke's Foundation and the William J. and Dorothy K. O'Neill Foundation. We have representatives from all of our sponsoring foundations with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Dr. Brooke Harris also appears as part of our Authors in Conversation series, sponsored in part by all residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all residents of the county for their support through that public grant. Community partners for today's program include Birthing Beautiful Communities, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, NAMI Greater Cleveland, the Positive Education Program, the Schubert Center for Child Studies at Case Western Reserve University, and University Hospitals. Our hospitality partners are the Global Center for Health Innovation, the Huntington Convention Center of Cleveland, and the Ritz-Carlton Cleveland. We thank you all for your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by many nonprofit and community organizations. Please consult your printed program for a full list. We thank all of you for being here today. And the sale of Dr. Burke Harris's books are provided by a cultural exchange. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Dr. Burke Harris, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. And please complete your surveys. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.
Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.